I cried like a 23 year old baby. Yes, sir, I did. Because I've been so out of it, I have not vlogged, so I'm retelling the story now. And I'll just put my voice over on a lot of these different clips. I don't even know where to begin. When I was admitted last, I had wanted to try trickle feeds again. Because it's supposed to help stimulate the liver to release bile. Because when you're on TPN, the bile that is normally released by the liver just sits there. And that is called hepatic cholestasis. And it is very common in patients on long-term TPN. The GI doctor said absolutely not because we could not put my GJ tube back in because the J portion coming in contact with those patches on my intestines will make, will, will likely begin an, another GI bleed uh, and constant because it would always be there. She said that she would rather me try little bites by mouth because that will be more gentle. So I have been trying to eat bites here and there. On Monday, I ate six organic noodles. They're actually, some of them were wheat and others were veggie noodles. I got kind of reactive after that, but by Tuesday it had passed and I wanted to try it again. So I did and the same thing occurred. I knew those were probably a no-go, but later in the day I got hungry again and I tried to eat an enjoy life cookie that's about the size of a 50 cent piece. Most of it vented out, but of course some does pass through my pet tube and manages to work its way in my intestines. A couple hours later, I started to get a bad headache that I normally get when I'm going into an HLH or macrophage activation flare. I was also very nauseous and my fiance was telling me that I just really didn't look good. On Wednesday, I woke up with a 99.6 degree temperature. That is not my normal. I normally run low in the 96, 97 range, sometimes 98, depending on the day. I attributed it to eating, triggering one of those MAS crises that was coming on, because that is how it has proven in the past, me trying to eat or do feeds. But I had been hoping something would change. And the fever just never went away it kind of just kept bouncing around and by evening it was up to 102. now i did not want to go to the hospital especially if it's just an mas flare because the hospital was not going to do much anyway i would just i would need my blood counts monitored of course but i do extra steroids and that would likely fix the problem but i didn't want to do steroids either i was going to try to wait it out and see if my body corrected on its own. I was fearful of going to the ER because of COVID-19. Because if I don't have it now, I'm gonna come out of there with it, with my immune system. My mom and everyone tried to get me to go in, but I refused. So I went to my bed and I tried to go to sleep and then I'm getting the rigors and I just feel like that's warmed over. But I was still convinced that it was HLH MAS. I had an MRI scheduled for Thursday morning and I had developed this left upper quadrant pain that nobody has been able to determine what it is. And it had been progressively worsening over the last three weeks and it had been something I had never felt before. And we ruled out that it was my lungs, but the GI doctor thought it could be my pancreas or ascites from my liver disease or it could also be stones forming in the bile duct because i am on tpn and it can sometimes cause crystals 
despite me not having a gallbladder. That is why the GI doctor ordered a stat MRI. So I also need, I wanted to get that done. I thought that if I woke up the next morning and my temperature was only 100 and something, then I could get, do some extra steroid and it would go back down. Well, I woke up and I was 104.2. That is too far gone to for steroid to bring down low enough to where the MRI facility will let me in the building. So I had to call and cancel that. My vitals were starting to go wonky. Selena was trying to get me to go in. My mom was trying to get me to go in. And I'm begging for someone to call my oncologist to see if I can have a direct admit. We called the oncology office and the oncology office said that my doctor was not coming in until 10 a.m. and even if they were able to work me in, they're not gonna let me in the building because again, they're scanning for fevers and I was running 104.2 and I don't have, I didn't have a negative COVID test because I hadn't been tested since my fever. So they couldn't let me in that way. And they said, honestly, with a fever that high, I couldn't even wait much longer that I just need to go to the ER and that they were sending us some of their other patients through the ER. And unfortunately, it's just something that if there's a problem, that's that extensive, it needs to be done. I cried like a 23 year old baby. Yes, sir, I did. I did not wanna go. And I was afraid that they're not, we weren't gonna let visitors, they weren't gonna let visitors in. So I, and I didn't wanna be alone, but I got to the ER and they made me wait in the waiting room and there's all these signs that say respiratory illness, like get away from me, but the ER, I need, I'm brand specific with supplies and the hospital ER pharmacy does not know my needs and it takes them forever to obtain it. It's usually once I get on the floor that they can take over and even then sometimes they have to wait and I have to use my own supplies for a day. I can't really carry all that in by myself. So they let my mom in to the front desk and my mom had said that she needed to talk to the pharmacy before she left because I had special medications for the ER. So they managed to let her in the ER because they thought she would be more of an asset than a hindrance, but we were expecting that once she got to the floor that she'd have to leave. They took me back after waiting for about half an hour in that waiting room there were positive COVID cases in the ER while I was there. And that really freaks me out. And they were treating me as if I had the cootie bugs too until I was proven negative. So they had to swab up my nose and they also tested for the flu, but the COVID swab goes up farther than the flu one. And it was very uncomfortable. Alright, so this, you've had a flu saw before? Back in the day. This one goes a little bit further. COVID, so we have to go as far as we can without resistance. Okay? Two seconds per nair, I'll promise you. Okay? Be gentle. I like to use my left hand kind of behind you just for support. Okay? Just so you're not kicking back on anything. We're going to kind of get you to tip, <coughs> excuse me, tilt your nose down. Perfect, right there. Alright, here we go. One, two, three. Alright, resistance, we're going to stop. One, two, three. That one should be your best one. And we're done. Great job. <laughs> Awful, I know. They, that was negative by the way. And the flu was negative. They checked my labs and my CBC came back. Let's see. All right, so you're complete. I actually just came back. So your white count is 17. Um, your hemoglobin is 9.8, your hematocrit is 30.5. Yep. Neutrophils are 15.3, so it's a lot. You are septic, sweetheart. Better than low on the neutrophils, though. It's good. But it says there's an infection somewhere. Yep. So I'm glad I took those out of that central line just to be sure. That proves there's an infection somewhere. And here I am thinking it was still an HLH-MAS thing. But in my defense, 
infections can trigger that and those markers for HLH and MAS had doubled and quadrupled from what they were just a couple days before my fever started. So I was working on having one of those de developed too because you get a particular headache and a particular bone pain and it only comes when you're in one of those crises. It doesn't come with regular sepsis. I've had sepsis two other times before developing HLH and MAS and it feels different. They also drew blood cultures and took other labs. When was the last time this one was flashed? Um, this morning after TV. I was brought up to the floor. They did allow my mom to stay. We didn't even ask. It was just by the grace of God. By the time I got to the floor, I was doing very poorly. Eventually, no one could even wake me up. I wasn't responding. 12 hours later, my blood cultures grew bacteria but we were surprised it was actually sepsis my first line infection in four years they removed good old barney the bard power hickman that had been in place since september of 2016 and i'm very sad about it guys they're gonna place a new one on this side when my cultures are clear, and I'm gonna name that one Barbie the Bard Power Hickman. Oh, hi. What's up? Um, I'm sorry. I'm tired. Loopy. I have amnesia. I don't know about amnesia. You've been sitting around and out of your mouth for a while. <laughs> what else you got to say? I don't know. I can only see things when I. Go. <laughs> I see it's like two of things out of the side. Unless I go like this. So you can only see with one eye? You want a patch? Put your mask on one eye. be a pirate. But I gotta go to bed so I can get my MRI. Okay. Sweet dreams. They also sent me down to MRI to check that upper quadrant area. The first night I fell asleep in the MRI machine because I just couldn't stay awake. And like I said, I was off and on, like not responsive. And I didn't even realize I fell asleep in the MRI that people told me once I got out. And I kind of messed it up because I couldn't do the breathing for them to get good enough pictures. So the next day I had to go repeat my MRI when I was doing a little better and more coherent and awake but anyways as soon as my cultures came back they called the nurse to discontinue my TPN because you can't use the line when you are septic because it just pumps the bacteria into you and our hypothesis or what infectious disease said is that a this type of bug is it's a water bug. It likes contaminated IV fluids and that it's wise to contact our home health company just to let them know in case they wanted to test and to ensure that they send a whole new shipment and then I'm not using anything from the previous shipment. Or this bacteria also sometimes lives in the gastrointestinal tract and when your immune system is compromised and your GI tract is compromised, it can permeate the bowel wall, which goes to your bloodstream and then attaches to the central line. We are leaning more towards that because of how correlated this was with me trying to eat. And I have all of these ulcers throughout my intestines, which is the perfect opportunity for bacteria to leak.
I'm responding well to the antibiotics, providing my culture still, repeat culture still stay clear. I am getting, I'm having surgery tomorrow for a new line placement, and then I can go home and start TPN again, but I'll be on IV antibiotics for another couple of weeks. Now in radiology, about to get my new line placed, Barbie. The Bard Power Hickman, but I'm ready because I need TPN. I've gained 10 pounds of just water weight because my albumin has dropped so long. But my feet are swollen, hands, my legs, my abdomen. I am out of the procedure. Rest in peace, Barney. Welcome to the world, Barbie. I think that's what I've said on Barbie. I need a B.A.R. and I could do Barbara, but I know too many Barbaras. I'm just gonna go with Barbie. Barbie's so girly. I'm girly. They got the line in. Apparently I bled a lot. I'm not allowed to go home because my potassium is too something. And I have to get four bags of it and it's going to take too long. So I'll have to leave in the morning, which I'm not necessarily pleased about. But I am happy to be starting TPN tonight. Since people aren't allowing visitors, I had to do the whole IR deal alone. And that was just exhausting. The doctor wanted it one way, I wanted it another way, and we were just going back and forth until she conceded. I mean, I wasn't rude or anything. And did she, I didn't, how did yeah. she concede? I mean, what did she say? She said, I'll do it, but it's not, I wouldn't recommend it. What I wanted them to do was stitch around the insertion site instead of around the wings. Yeah. When you stitch around the wings with these barred power Hickmans, you can't wear a stat lock. And when they also when they stitch around the wing, it makes doing dressing changes very difficult because you cannot lift up the line enough. And the third thing is also when you stitch the wings, I am connected to multiple infusions on both lumens just about 24 hours a day. And those lines get heavy and they pull. And just the sutures aren't very supportive. The line is more likely to fall out that way than if I were to just have it stitched in another spot and use a stat lock because I tolerate the stat lock. She did not advise that because she said that it's not as supportive and the cuff could fall out, but she's not, I don't think she's thinking about people that are connected all the time. And then I want it on the other side of my chest and not the same side that the old line was on but she didn't want that either and then i had to talk to anesthesia myself and the guy like waltz is up in there and before he comes you can hear him say what room number blah blah, blah. and then the nurse told them and they're like he's looking through the paper and he goes i haven't read a thing i know nothing about this face and that was stressful i changed out of the hospital gown after i took Nap. I guess the moral of the story here is that even when I think something is an HLH MAS crisis, it could still be an infection along with that. So I have to go to the hospital every time. And the other lesson is that I definitely appreciate having a supportive family because advocating for yourself when you're alone is hard. My potassium's running now. My neck is pretty sore. I feel like I got punched or like I've worked out really hard. I mean, it's nothing I want pain medication for, but it's kind of sore. And thank you for the prayers for the people on Instagram and Facebook that saw my friends and family's update. But yeah, thank you and 